Yeah, there you go, it's on the agenda. Good evening, everybody. I believe most are connecting to their audio still. So uh, we've got about, uh, looks like 60 people on the line right now. We're gonna give it a couple of minutes and then we'll get underway. But uh, good evening and hello to everybody. Hello again to everybody. We're just going to wait about another 60 seconds or so. We have a couple more people joining us and we'll get underway with our agricultural virtual town hall. Hello to all the faces I can see out there. We got about, uh, we're about 64, 65 people right now and we'll get started in less than a minute. All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry uh, Agricultural Virtual Town Hall, if that's not a long enough title for everybody. Want to thank you for joining us. We've, uh, we're certainly adapting to what we call a new norm uh, here in the last month or so. Uh, used to being out at community events, seeing people and getting feedback. Uh, that hasn't happened, obviously, as much, so we're getting used to living in Zoom meetings these days, but we found them to be uh, an effective way of giving you a bit of an update on some of the issues we're working on and also a chance for you uh, not only to ask some questions but to give your feedback on, uh, on issues, particularly in the agricultural industry tonight. I'm just gonna start off with uh, Adrian from my office. Adrian's kind of behind the scenes moderator and I'm just gonna have him give you the instructions and when we get to uh, the point where we'll do some questions back and forth, he'll just explain the raise your hand feature and how that works, Adrian. Good evening, everyone and welcome. So. I have been receiving quite a few questions uh, via email uh, over the past couple of days, and we will get to those questions as well, um, but also being taking, uh, taking questions obviously live from you here this evening. What you'd like to do, if you would, are interested in asking a question, under the participants tab, there is a, if you click on that, an option to raise your hand. So if you click on that raise your hand, it'll notify me that you are interested in asking a question and it will put that in chronological order for me to get to that way. If you are calling in by phone, what you will need to do is press star nine and that will indicate again to me that you'd like to ask a question and I can then open up your, your microphone so that you're able to ask that question to any of our representatives this evening. So with that, I will turn it back over. Thanks, and we're very lucky to have uh, not only our MPP, Jim McDonnell, but Ontario's Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, Minister Hartleman, uh, who's joining us, I believe, from his constituency office. So what I thought first is before I pass it over to Jim and to the minister, tonight we'll make it a focus mostly on some of the provincial files since we do have the minister here. Uh, what I'm going to offer or mention that probably in the next week or two, we'll host a second agricultural town hall like this that will have more of a focus on some federal issues. And I hope to have one of my uh, agriculture committee colleagues uh, from Ottawa join us that are on the Ag Committee. Uh, I'm on uh, the, the Nerdier House and Procedural Affairs Committee and, and keep briefed, of course, of what uh, Ag's doing, but to have one of my colleagues talk about some of the issues they've been working on and doing. So uh, stay tuned for that. Just a couple of things that I know we've been working on at a federal level. 
about deeming agriculture an essential service and as critical infrastructure. Uh, we've seen the province take a good lead on their essential business list, and that may get brought up tonight, but I think a lot, uh, an overwhelming part of the agricultural sector uh, has been uh, captured in that, considering the importance to food, uh, food supply, and again, obviously to our planting season coming up. We've had a lot of questions on some of the business programs. Uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account, that's the $40,000 loan, 10,000 of which is a grant if you're able to pay the amount back by the end of 2022. Um, and we have also, uh, through the Community Futures Development Corporation locally in Cornwall, they're gonna have some additional dollars to lend out to some businesses that fall through the cracks. Um, I would encourage you, uh, and we're gonna send in the link tomorrow, we had a seminar on Friday uh, with Andrew Sege of Sege Financial. It was about 90, 100 minutes long. They went through in very good detail uh, the business account loan, the wage subsidy that's available at the federal level, and goes through some of those details. So if your business is interested in uh, more information on that, I would encourage you to check out the clip that we send you tomorrow and learn more about that. I will say there's some advocacy that we're still working on of where uh, payroll is only off of your T4 summaries. Uh, it was lower to 20,000 uh, as the minimum limit, uh, but we have several businesses that are smaller in nature, particularly many in agriculture that I've spoke to uh, that pay themselves off of dividends uh, and or are sole proprietorships uh, and they aren't eligible. So we're still working on that. If you fall into that category, please reach out to my office. Uh, we're trying to get the government to give some more flexibility in that program. I think there's some questions on beef processing. That is a national and now, frankly, an international issue with some challenges in the United States. That's been a file we've been working on. And I just will note, going back to businesses again, because I see many friends in the agribusiness uh, tourism side that have joined us tonight, uh, a key piece of information we want people to know and to clarify, the federal government has postponed the payments for your GST, HST remittances for this quarter. They've been postponed until uh, for a couple of months. However, it's very key to know, and I was corrected on this last week, is that that does not delay your filing. The payment is delayed, but you still do need to file uh, by the regular deadline. So I've had several businesses that weren't aware of that or thought that their filing and payment was delayed. It's just the payment. Filing still happens on your regular deadline. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I just will mention some things we, Jimmy and I have been working on is internet connectivity in rural areas. I'll bet you 10 bucks with my luck, I will drop off this call tonight and come back on. Uh, I'm in the suburbs of South Mountain and we have internet connectivity problems uh, here as well. But this has certainly raised some momentum for better internet capacity as we can and cell capacity. And Jimmy and I have had several conversations and we have a few more this week on our uh, rural fairs. I've been speaking to uh, some of our fairs, not all. I see Barbara Ann Glode on the call. She's one of my calls for tomorrow uh, with her many hats on, but is connecting with the fairs to see what we can do. In all likelihood, they will not be running as per normal. Several have canceled, uh, but we wanna reach out and make sure that our fairs can survive and be uh, stronger uh, at the end uh, when we rebound and be able to be strong when this is all done. So with that being said, I'll pass it over to Jim to do an introduction and introduce the minister. Okay, I just uh, want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and um, thanking for Adrian and um, Eric for um, putting logistics together. It's always uh, um, great to have somebody do that, that legwork. Um, I just wanted to uh, share my screen quickly. I'm not sure if, uh, just a second here. Uh, do that. I just wanted just quickly. So, uh, so one thing I know that there's a, a lot of programs out there, support programs, and we just wanted to make sure that um, uh, everybody was aware of them. Um, we have uh, uh, a number. Of, we have uh, developed a website at the provincial side that includes both fit provincial and federal uh, um, programs. And as you see there, the just the the, the email address at uh, www.covidsupports.ca. Uh, forward slash Jim McDonnell and it brings up all the programs and it's updated uh, pretty well daily. It includes the programs that we released uh, like Fridays were there uh, that Friday night. Uh, I haven't looked at today's but it's a type of uh, thing that we try to keep up to date and um, as we go through um, this um, issue I know that um, 
Um, there's a lot of updates today about the bringing the, the uh, our economy back. We uh, are reviewing over the next couple of weeks what businesses that uh, um, would be the easiest uh, and maybe the most uh, required. Um, so we're, we're doing a bit of a study. We're looking at a step pro, uh, process where we'll increase it incrementally, uh, take a break, look at how it affects our numbers. And uh, just to put something in perspective, uh, the big news on last week was GM was gonna produce uh, a million masks a month for, uh, for use in Canada. And our use in Ontario is, for the health sector alone is almost a million a day. So it just shows the requirements that uh, we're looking for to uh, allow us to get back to normal. So um, it's a big challenge, but anyway, I don't want to take up too much time here. I want to mention that, uh, or introduce our, our guest, Ernie Hardiman, um, a good friend of mine. I first got to know uh, Ernie when as a counselor uh, under the Mike Harris days. Uh, Ernie was the Minister of Agriculture back then. He um, certainly comes from an agriculture business. He um, is uh, you know a longtime member of the, the second time round as as ag minister. He's certainly very much uh, aware of the issues of, of farms, uh, the, what the farmers are looking for, what they need, and uh, he kind of prides himself with uh, maybe being a little hard to snow sometimes. But uh, um, anyway, tonight he's joining us from his uh, his uh, constituent office, and that's because he has. Uh, not great internet service at home. So he certainly knows the problem that a lot of you guys are having and uh, whether it comes to agriculture or just basic uh, internet con connectivity. And I wanna thank uh, him for joining tonight because it is a late night farm again, but uh, it's not as late as it usually because uh, before he was minister, he used to drive back and forth every night uh, to Oxford and uh, which is you know, um, a two hour drive at, at best and he'd leave at eight o'clock and he'd be back around 6.30 or seven in the morning. So um, used to pick up Jane McKenna and she used to complain about the early hours <laughs> on the pickup to get back into town. So anyway, uh, welcome Ernie and uh, turn the show over for you if you have a few opening comments. And... Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. And, and I want to thank you, Jim and, uh, and Eric for, for hosting us here this evening. And Jim, I want to thank you that the last time we held a round table uh, in your constituency, I had to spend about five hours or six hours to get there. So obviously, even though I didn't have internet at home and I had to come to the office, I can tell you that this meeting was a lot easier to get to and I will get home a lot earlier yet tonight than I would from the, from the last one. But we do want to thank you for, uh, uh, for hosting this, the two of you, uh, to give us an opportunity to talk to the, to the good folks in your riding. I know how extremely busy you all are. And I appreciate the time uh, that you take uh, to talk about the challenges you're facing and how we can work together to overcome them. I wanna start by taking a moment to thank all of you. Thank you for the critical work of our incredible farmers and our entire agriculture sector for ensuring the people of Ontario have access to safe, high quality food and agriculture products during these challenging times. You are truly Ontario's agri-food heroes, and I can't say that enough. It's important to recognize that behind healthcare, the agri-food sector is critical to ensuring our province continues to operate during this outbreak and to feed the people of this province. At COVID-19, as COVID-19 continues to evolve daily, it's important to understand what issues different parts of the sector are facing so we can assure that any supports we provide reflect those industry concerns. I recognize that you're facing many challenges, including labor concerns, processing capacity, international border restrictions, and temporary foreign workers during this time of uncertainty. I want to assure you that our government is working to support you and collaborating closely with the federal government in a number of key areas. Just over a week ago, the Canadian and Ontario governments announced that we're giving up to $1 million to help connect workers with jobs in the agri-food sector to support our agri-food sector supply chain at this critical period. We're also providing up to 2.5 million investment to help our agri-food sector and farmers increase sales of Ontario food by helping them expand their operations at business online with the new agri-food open for e-business program. And as a part of our broader plans to help our farmers, we're extending the deadline for new participants and enrollment changes to the risk management programs for livestock and grains and oilseeds to June the 30th, 2020. 
We understand that your needs can change daily, and that's why we're listening to farmers like yourselves across the sector to hear and learn from them directly about what's top of mind. We're committed to working closely with all of you to keep Ontario's food supply system strong and responsive during this difficult time. I know that access to labour is an immediate concern to you right now. As you know, temporary foreign workers, including seasonal agriculture workers, already committed to come to Canada are exempt from the travel restrictions and may come to provide that critical labour we need for the growing season. I know many have started to arrive and more are expected in the weeks ahead. And while we are, they are required to self-isolate for 14 days upon arrival, I'm optimistic that we will be able to work within the system. We thank the federal government for providing $50 million to help farmers with the temporary foreign workers with costs associated with the measures necessary to follow the man mandatory 14 day isolation period. And I continue to work closely with my federal counterpart, Ms. Bebo, to see how access to vital labor resources can be maintained. I'm aware that processing capacity is a concern, particularly in our beef sector, before the COVID-19 outbreak began. Back in February, alongside the federal government, we announced up to two million towards a project to improve and expand operations at provincially licensed abattoirs. We've extended the deadline for applying to this program to June the 30th of this year to allow abattoirs to focus on the priorities their priorities at this challenging time. More recently, our government announced $150,000 to train new food inspectors to help protect Ontario's food supply chain against the COVID-19. Rest assured that we'll keep advocating to the federal government for support on processing work with them and for processing and working with them to address the issues that COVID-19 poses in this area. While we continue to monitor the global and national COVID situation, we're also taking strong action to contain the spread of this virus in our province. Nothing is more important than the health and well-being of Ontarians, including protecting Ontario's food supply and those working in the agri-food sector. We also continue to work closely with the federal government to ensure our producers and processors have the support they need. And I want to thank Mr. Mac Minister or, uh, Jim McDonnell, my friend, and uh, MP uh, Duncan for their letting, join me, letting me join you this evening. It's hard to believe how much things have changed since I joined Jim in Cornwall back in February for one of those old fashioned face to face meetings with farmers like yourself. Uh, that was in the old days. We no longer get to do that face to face. We all recognize these are different, difficult times, but I want to assure you, we'll keep working with you to ensure our agriculture sector stay strong. I'm looking forward to hearing more of your concerns and issues so we can help address your needs. I know that I'm always, I know that I am always listening and that Ontario government is committed to doing everything we can to help agriculture industry and hardworking farmers during this difficult but beatable challenge. And again, I uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. And we do look forward to have a, a dialogue back and forth and answer any questions we have. I do, um, I do want to say to everybody listening that Jim and I have, a, have an agreement that I will answer all the questions asked except those that I find too difficult and Jim will look after them for me. So uh, thank you very much for that, Jim. And with that, I'll turn it back over to, uh, uh, to the moderator. And I just want to thank Eric. Been, or, uh, Ernie's been down three times since um, uh, the 2018, so he's uh, no stranger to the riding. And uh, every time he comes down, it's uh, unfortunately, or usually, uh, lately, it's been a good news uh, story. And he's been down um, in the previous uh, four or five years a couple times, but usually because then it was a problem with a drought or, or uh, some other issue. So anyway, thanks. It's great to see you again, Ernie. And so thank, thanks, Mr. Hardiman. So uh, Adrian, I think you have the list of questions there. We'll go through them. And again, uh, just a reminder of the raise your hand feature. We'll do a mix of, we'll try to get through as many email questions that were pre-submitted, uh, but then we'll go back and forth uh, with a couple of live questions in between. So uh, Adrian, do you want to fire off with the first one, please? Absolutely. So just a reminder again, if you are calling in and you wanted to ask a question, it's star nine to raise your hand. Uh, other than that, on, for those on the video or on the Zoom app, under participants, click raise your hand. And as Eric said, we will alternate uh, in some live questions as well as the ones that were pre-submitted. Um, first question actually that came in, Mr. Minister, is actually directly for, for yourself. 
and it has to do with uh, the progress on Bill 156. And there was, uh, we had three questions on that. So if I let you give an update on that. Well, thank you very much for the question. And obviously we were somewhat disappointed because we had in record time, we had prepared the bill and taken it out for consultation. And then we had uh, brought it into the house for second reading. We got second reading complete in record time. And then we uh, uh, sent it to committee and it was at committee when, uh, when the house recessed. And of course, that's when uh, uh, COVID-19 came to that place. So we had to cancel all the committee uh, hearings and that's where it is now. So when the, when the house goes back, we expect it to go back to, uh, uh, to those committee hearings. Uh, when they're finished, we can then make uh, changes based on what we've heard and what requires changing. And then hopefully it would go back into house for third reading and pass and be, become implemented. Having, having said that, if I could just quickly, having said that, I, I think we have to uh, make sure that we, we understand that uh, um, the committee hearings, because we had scheduled them to be outside of Toronto and to go and hear from our farming and agriculture community, uh, it would be very hard to do that uh, via virtually. So we want, to, uh, we want to wait till we're back to having the ability to take the committee hearing to the people. Thank you. Another question that came in from John, asking about his line of work. So he does inspections on grain and feed analyzers, uh, and he's a third party inspector. He usually goes to the large farms and processor facilities. Will he still be able to do this moving forward? And if yes, under what new procedures? Well, he would have to, uh, as far as the, um, yes, he would be able to do it if his work is directly connected to the agriculture and food uh, value chain, uh, he would be able to carry on doing that as to under what conditions he would have to do it, he would have to check with the Board of Health as to what they deem is necessary or with the Ministry of Labor, but what things they would deem to be necessary to make sure that he was getting the proper distancing and, and social distancing from, from other people and what um, things they needed to put, put in place depending on who, whether he was working by himself or whether he was working with a group of people and the type of um, uh, safety equipment that would be needed in place. The number one priority is that we uh, keep people safe. Number two priority is to make sure that we keep our food chain and um, operating smoothly. And so he has to do them in that order. Thank you. Question came in from Tammy asking, the federal government is handing out $40,000 loans for any businesses who have at least one uh, in person on their payroll. Is the government looking to assist businesses with no payroll? referring to the many self-employed in the agricultural business like herself. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Uh, so I'll pick it up as a, at the federal level. That's referring to the Canada Emergency Business uh, Account, uh, which is the $40,000 loan uh, that goes through your bank lender. We did have a lot of businesses that did not qualify when the payroll was between $50,000 and $1 million. And I mentioned that in my introduction that they lowered it to $20,000 and raised it up to $1.5 million that did encompass a lot more businesses that might have one part-time staff in on payroll. The only way they're considering payroll right now is based on your T4 uh, summary that's provided, I think it's box 18 on your income tax return from the previous year. We're trying to get uh, some flexibility to acknowledge dividends uh, and sole proprietors. Uh, we do, I've, I've spoke to several uh, agricultural small businesses that don't fall uh, within that because of that reasoning. Uh, or that, uh, that uh, setup that they have. So we're trying to get some change on that. The one positive we may see, and, I, and um, it's still to be determined, is that the government has given some dollars to our local community futures development corporations uh, for similar type loans. They haven't got the details yet on eligibility on loan amounts, and if they're gonna be interest-free or looking like those SEBA $40,000 loans. But I think, I'm hoping, that those types of grants will help fill in some of those gaps. So I would encourage you to reach out to my office if you're uh, struggling with that. I will connect you with the CFDC and we're gonna continue to build the case regardless to allow that 40,000. But I agree there still are people falling through the cracks and I hope the government does give some flexibility. We're working on encouraging that. Okay, we have a question from the audience right now. Alain, Alain Dao, or Du, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, my, uh, Alain. Hi, thank you. It's Daou. So my name is uh, Alain Daou. I uh, represent the Eastern Ontario Agri-Food Network. Um, so I've been in consultation with quite a few uh, farmers and producers in SDNG and Prescott Russell. And as a result, I've put together three um, 
the three questions that sort of summarize some of their concerns. Um, so the first is with, with an increased demand for local food uh, combined with a potential lack of seasonal labor this year due to COVID-19, um, does our government intend to support farmers uh, through work programs and such? I know you touched on it a little bit, but is there any more, are there any more details with regards to how local, small local farmers uh, can be assisted with labor, potential labor disruptions this summer? Well, I, I think it's important to, to recognize, obviously, that we hope all the normal programs, such as the, uh, uh, the student um, uh, workers and so forth, can be, can be utilized in that. I know there's been a federal program that's been put in place that uh, that's going to support students. In fact, even students that volunteer, I guess uh, I was told by the federal minister that that would apply to our farmers, the ones that you're referring to, that they could use them too. Of course, the question um, has to be asked that uh, if you're already paying them to volunteer, um, are they really going to, and they don't have to go to work, are they really going to come and work? So I think we have to uh, address that with the, uh, with the federal program. Um, I think it's on the other part, I think all the things that we're doing to try and make the, the uh, farm work better, we've worked very diligently on making sure that in our essential list, that in the, in the, uh, in the food chain, that the, um, the local people selling having the roadside stands, the farmers markets and so forth are part of the, of the food distribution system so they, um, they can keep working and, and doing what they've always done. Um, obviously, uh, we, we want to do everything we can to make life easier. So as, the, uh, uh, as some of the red tape issues that we were working on before, they will, they will kick in and uh, extending all the deadlines and so forth to, get the, uh, uh, to give them time to get each one done. The, the deadline um, extension for the, uh, uh, the support programs is the one that's most important because obviously, um, when we're looking at how we're going to arrive at support for our agriculture community, um, and so far the discussions are indicating that they will have to be delivered or should be delivered through an existing program. So we want to make sure if that's how we end, where we end up with the federal government, we want to make sure that everybody has the ability to still enroll when that decision has been made. I would hate to see that decided and then then go out and tell everybody that they missed the deadline to get in on the program so they, it won't help them. So I think that's, the, that's a very important part of that extension to make sure that we're helping everybody going forward. And maybe we can, we can unmute uh, Alain again. Uh, Alain, did you have a couple of other questions? It looks like he's good. Oh, yes, uh, I, I did. Sorry, I was uh, I wasn't able to unmute myself. Uh, okay, I'll try to make it relatively quick then. Uh, the next question is actually with regards to the recently announced uh, United Counties of Prescott Russell Food Hub. Um, Eric uh, or Jim, have either of your offices been in contact or in consultation with the United Co United Counties of Prescott Russell regarding this food hub? And can you provide any additional details? If so, um, I have received a few. I guess concerns from some local farmers that the, the food hub might be in competition with some of their enterprises. And so it'd be nice to be able to clear the air and clarify some of the details regarding this project. Um, I know this isn't an SDNG project, but I'm, I'm hoping that perhaps you were in consultation and if you have any additional details for us. Um, I, I, I don't have any. I saw the information as, as you did about creating the 65 jobs along those lines. And I believe Adrian, we had one of, uh, one of the questions come in today about that. Uh, not only asking, I think there was one, uh, I had a comment about same thing, is there going to be competition with existing enterprises, but then also some people of local food producers asking, is it for Prescott Russell only? Is it regional? How far does that stretch go out? Those types of things. So one of the things I've already made a note on is I'm going to connect, I have to call tonight, my, my friend and colleague Francis Duruay tonight on another matter. I'm hoping to get a bit of a briefing on this. Uh, where at our next town hall, I can provide some answers and information on that from what I hear on that, some timelines. Uh, and then again, uh, I've had more questions and not about local producers in our SD&G neck of the woods asking, is there an opportunity to tie into that as well? And just some businesses asking and curious to see how it's going to go and what the setup looks like, those types of things. So unfortunately, I don't have much more than what you've likely read, uh, but uh, I will try to get some uh, already noted for our next town hall. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, and my last question is actually around agritourism. Oh, on, the, on the local food hub, I have received a, a, a presentation in my office about 
and we have had the opportunity to just look at the presentation. But as uh, as Eric mentioned, it's not very uh, much, we say, descriptive in how it's going to work. It's just the principle is going to work. I found it um, somewhat passing interesting that we knew how many people it was going to take, but we didn't know yet what it was going to do. And so I think we do need a little more work on the on the the. Uh, I think the principle is a great idea. I, I think we need to work on what it is they're actually going to do. Uh, you know, uh, how, how we evolved. We're going to have processing plants for all, for, for beef, pork, and, and, um, uh, and, and poultry. Uh, and it's going to be federal inspected. But uh, is that going to be practical to have those, those facilities for that size of facility to have that many different, uh, different entities in it? And, I think that needs to be worked out yet too, but we'd be happy to uh, have our ministry work with them to, uh, to work some of those things out. Well, I'll unmute Alain again, I believe third, uh, might be a third question. We'll let you go Alan with the third one here, if we can get you unmuted again. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just mute myself when I'm done. Uh, okay, so the last one is around agritourism. Um, and I know you touched on that a little bit, Eric. So. Uh, I guess my question is, does the provincial government intend to take any steps in support of the agritourism industry um, once restrictions have been lifted? And uh, what is it that we can do in preparation for that so that we can uh, enhance and, and uh, further um, work with farmers who are interested in introducing some agritourism elements to their uh, enterprise? Well, I think, first of all, I want to say we very much appreciate the value of ag tourism in our agriculture, in our rural communities. Uh, it's what makes our rural communities uh, and it's what's connect our farmers with, uh, with those communities. Um, as far as the support for that going forward, um, the, -tour the tourism part of it would be part of the Ministry of Tourism. We have been in discussions with her already on working uh, jointly on a, on a plan of dealing with agritourism. We were talking about that before the, the COVID-19 came along and hopefully we can work into that. It presently, as we look at uh, easing in into our economy again, it doesn't look like tourism will be the first item on the list uh, to be opened up. And so I think as we as we move forward with that, we will, when it does open up, this will be a great opportunity for us to get with the Minister of Tourism and and talk about how we can help uh, get the tourism ag tourism back. Okay, we'll go to another question here that's uh, that came in via email. Now I'll, I'll try to lump a few of these together because we received quite a few questions with respect to abattoirs uh, across the province uh, and some issues that have been seen in other parts of Canada as well. If there's any type of contingency plans, should abattoirs be forced to close due to COVID-19? Any other considerations being taken uh, to allow for farmers to get their animals to slaughter? Well, <laughs> I, I think that's a, a, a very difficult question. And, and obviously we're doing everything we can to help uh, the, the abattoirs that presently in existence uh, dealing with the workforce to, uh, first of all, to make sure that they have all the safety uh, precautions in place to try and prevent um, infection there uh, and, and working with them. What can we do to help you uh, keep, keep your people working? The number one issue we presently have in, in the major plants is that uh, people are concerned about going to work. So I think we have our work cut off for us to make sure we get the message out that we do have all those safety precautions. And uh, as uh, somebody told me that likely the safest place when it comes to biosecurity and uh, from disease, the safest place you can be is in, a, in a, a processing plant because of all the precautions that are there to make sure we have safe food. And, but that doesn't keep the, the um, infection from coming in with workers. And so we have to, they're all having put a system in place to make sure we, we protect that. We don't have a system in place to, if they have to just completely close down and not be able to start up again or with, have to have a complete new workforce, and we don't have one of those to do that. So we have to make sure we do everything to protect the workforce that is in there now uh, as best we can to, uh, so they can keep processing. We work, um, uh, we're in contact with the, um, particularly the major plants, uh, oh, at least every third day to see, to make sure what's going on and what's happening and what we can do to, uh, uh, to, to uh, keep the thing working. We also have been in contact, or obviously we, we already shipped some of our pork outside of our province and we're still doing that. Uh, and um, we're 
some going to Quebec, but they're having the same problem we have. So uh, we're, um, we have to keep working on it. So far, uh, we've been able to process all the pork we have and the beef uh, is still, that which isn't in the plant yet, at least is still out, uh, out in the, in the feedlots uh, being fed. So uh, we're, still, we're still moving ahead. But obviously, it's a it's a big a big challenge to try and keep them keep them open and keep them working. Okay, a uh, couple questions coming in with regards. This is more federal, Eric, about the summer job program for students, uh, and if there's any news on that. Looking for students to come work on the farms. Uh, okay, so if people have applications in uh, with everything with COVID going on, the deadline for Canada summer jobs. And I believe the minister uh, talked about that, that federal program earlier. The deadline was a couple of months ago. And normally by now, they would be contacting successful applicants uh, that they have uh, received uh, student funding and those types of things. Um, what they had done is because of COVID-19, there's going to be a variety of different not-for-profits, for example, municipalities that would normally get it for funding their lifeguards or their recreational programming that may not be going ahead with them. So what they asked us to do as local members, if we were aware of businesses that are essential that may be interested, we had fed those names to them uh, by the end of last week. Our understanding from Service Canada is that they're going to begin contacting successful uh, applicants uh, in the next week or two is the line that we, uh, we have been aware of. Uh, understanding that very often some of these start on May the 1st, there will be a bit of a delay, but the changes this year being a bit positive, if you are confirmed, it is 100% coverage, not just $2 an hour. They cover the wage and it goes beyond the normal period as well. So that certainly will help uh, some of our essential uh, jobs and works. Uh, I don't have the exact list of where it's going to be, uh, but again, in a week or two, which is a little bit later than normal, but again, the circumstances of where they're trying to fit those that aren't going to be usually in the chain and those that might want to join it this year with the circumstances. So um, if you haven't heard in a few weeks, perhaps get a hold of my office where we could check the status, but that's the game plan that we've uh, been advised of. Thank you, Eric. Uh, again, if there's any questions from the crowd, I just ask you to use the raise your hand function so that I, I know that you're looking to ask a question. And Adrian, just while we're doing that, I just want to know, we'll do another email question, but I see that Irene Cameron is joined us. And maybe after we do another email question, I'd love Irene to talk about cideries and give a pitch to the minister about the five acre rule. And I see that Julia is on here from the Milk Marketing Board. Uh, she had some, we've been playing some bad telephone tag, but uh, for her to talk about uh, dairy and some of the retail aspects, but we'll maybe do an email question first. Sure. So a couple of emails actually came in. And again, I'm trying to lump these questions together into one just for the sake of simplicity. Um, having to do with the Canada Agricultural Partnership Program, uh, why these decisions were coming out so late, uh, and if there will be other opportunities for uh, Ontario farms to apply for partnership programs in 2020. Well, I... I uh... I think the one of the things, the um, the main one, uh, the one directly to farmers was um, uh, we actually opened it up very very early, and it's uh, it came through um, one one at a time, shall we say? That uh, we opened it up, we it doesn't close until we um, until we have um, allocated the money available, and so uh, we we some of that went out really early, but we kept it open, and so some of them are a little bit later. That, that stream is, uh, is, is, is finished now, and it, that will be finished for this year. There are some other uh, parts of it that are still, uh, and other streams that are still going, that, um, uh, like the ones for the industry, the, uh, and there's one, I think, for the, uh, uh, for the environmental stream. I, I think it still has some going in. But um, the, um, the, the main one to directly to farmers was a, we opened it, I think, on February the 20th, and it was a continual one. It was all um, up until now. It was always that they had a time frame that everybody had to send it in, and then um, when they closed, then they would have to start reviewing them. And by the time it got through, we were midsummer before before anything anything happened. And so um, we decided to put it, open it on on one day, and then just keep accepting. And that's what we put in the application. We keep accepting them until. Um, and we keep approving them until we run out of money on first come first serve basis all the way through. 
and uh, we have just just completed with that. They would have been they wouldn't have been near as late if we had had a deadline on it. But then they would have all been later. This one here, they just kept coming out until the money was gone, and then uh, then we let everybody that that was beyond that were notified that there was no more money they could they can reapply the next intake, which would be for next year's uh, spending. But the, everybody can now get on with those projects before the uh, uh, before the, the building season or whatever the uh, the season is that they were going to use it for is done. Uh, all right, Adrian, are we able to unmute uh, Irene Cameron, perhaps? Yes, How am I supposed to? Just give me one second here. Oh. There we go. Oh, Hello, good Irene. evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for... Uh, for, well, inviting me to uh, speak. I have my son, Matthew, here. And as you know, Matthew has started a cidery, Upper Canada Cider Company in Glen Walter. And uh, we're very excited about the response that his cider has been getting. Um, right now, he's licensed to manufacture cider and to sell cider by the glass uh, and to sell his cider into bars, restaurants, host events at his facility, but he is not licensed to sell retail. Um, and so with COVID-19, what that's done is it's effectively shut him down. He's still able to manufacture the cider, but he's not able to distribute it in any way. So his revenue streams have completely dried up. Um, if he were a cidery that was located on five acres of orchard, he would be permitted to sell both online and also have a retail store. Um, if he were a microbrewery, he would be able to sell online and, and curbside uh, pickup. But because he is a cidery that's not located on five acres, he doesn't have that option uh, to be licensed to sell retail. So what we would like is for the government to eliminate that rule because um, we see it as being um, arbitrary and putting his business uh, at jeopardy and a, a distinct disadvantage to um, cideries that his landowning counterparts. So, um, well, and, and thank you very much for the uh, for the question. And um, uh, obviously, um, I wasn't there when they decided to put that criteria in. What qualifies it to be a a licensed cidery that can sell it that way. Um, somebody must have had a reason for doing that that, that way. Um, I think it's appropriate. I don't, I, those same people I'm sure didn't anticipate the situation we'd find ourselves in today either. So um, I think we could, um, we can have a look at that. But again, I can't change the, uh, the criteria of what the work fits in, particularly when it comes into um, um, cider, cider manufacturing and, and alcohol distribution. Um, there's, there's certain parameters they put in there that have to apply to everyone and we can't just change them, uh, change them at will, but we can look at that one to see if there is an, uh, an opportunity. And uh, I think jurisdiction wise, I was talking to, I know Jim has uh, been, uh, been doing this as well. And I believe Jim, the minister responsible for the alcohol and gaming AGCO is, um, is, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Attorney General Jones, I believe, correct, Sylvia Jones? No, no the, the, uh, the, the uh, spirits is the Minister of Finance. Yeah, Minister of Finance. The tax, he's the one, the taxation, yeah. Okay. So we've, we've sent something up to them. We just haven't heard back um, yet from them. Um, they, only, they are busy, but uh, uh, so we should be getting something back. It's been a, maybe about a week since uh, we sent our information up making with that request. But... Um, it might be something that will come up through the uh, uh, as we start to ease up the economy, but it would require some legislative change, I believe. And I and I've said to I've said to Irene and said to Jim, this is exactly why we have these forums is to hear about these things. I know even before COVID, they called the matters of perhaps red tape or re-examining these things, and this is why we host these is for people to have the minister's ear and the and Jimmy's ear uh, to raise these things forward. I know from a federal level, we've seen changes. Provincially, we've seen changes because a case and a pitch has been able to make. So 
Irene, I appreciate you joining us. And uh, uh, Minister, I promise if there's a change, Matthew will give you a free sample up at Queen's Park. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, just, I just want to say, Eric, as you mentioned, this is a perfect example of the red tape that we talked about before COVID came along. And we, um, twice a year, when we were sitting, twice a year, we would introduce a, what they call a red tape bill that we could include, open up all the other bills that needed to be opened up. Uh, to make sure we got rid of some of this red tape. So um, you're right. We can look into it to see what we can do. Wonderful. Uh, Adrian, I'd love to unmute Julia. I believe uh, I saw her on here. Um, there she is. Hello, Julia. We'll unmute you. Uh, and uh, sorry for the telephone tag. I would call when you're putting the kids to bed and then you'd call me when I was on a Zoom call. But uh, Julia is a wonderful member of the, one of our local milk marketing boards. Uh, and we were talking, I believe, about uh, dairy and some of the retail rules. So Julia, I'll let you uh, have the minister's ear for a moment. Nope, we don't, have a, we don't have any audio on you. I can hear you, I can see you talk, but I can't hear you talk. Let's see if this is going to work now. You're muted again. Try talking and see if that'll work. No luck. All right, maybe, Julie, what we'll do is we'll go to Adrian with another email question. We'll see if we can get your volume working. How's that sound? All right. You, you try it on your end. We'll go to another question. Okay. Technology is great when it works right. <laughs> we actually have a couple of questions still in the crowd here. Martin Lang, I will uh, unmute you. Martin, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to everyone uh, for organizing and putting this on. And uh, my question is to uh, Minister Hardiman, and uh, maybe Mr. Duncan can listen as well because there's a federal aspect of this. Um, it's been very great that the province has uh, been involved in RMP for the last number of years at the 40% level, but we do have a $100 million cap, I believe, still in place. And I'm just wondering what the chances are of getting a fully funded RMP this year. Uh, take the $100 million cap off and get the federal government to come in with their 60%. Well, I, think, I think on that one, our discussion uh, presently is, um, and that's why things are not moving as fast as, uh, as some would like. Our discussion is working with the federal government to increase the support so we have sufficient support for all, uh, um, all our farmers uh, based on federal provincial model rather than a provincial model only. Um, the chances of us getting a full funded 100% RMP, that our provincial one, is uh, next to nil uh, because uh, the federal government has no interest in starting to fund our provincial program. So we are working with them as how we can make sure that we get the full uh, support of the federal government, the support we need, and that's why we're kind of working with, well, so kind of we're looking at working with them to work put our efforts in a, a much um, enhanced uh, egg stability program with a, a trigger that works actually high enough so they get rid of the reference margins and, and a trigger high enough that you can actually get support out of egg stability. Thank you very much. Okay. And I believe next we've got, uh, Adrian, do you have Shelly Lyle there? I do, yes. Shelly, go ahead. From Hi. Memory. Do I need to, uh, am I okay? Am I on? Thank you. Um, it's more of a, of a comment and a, an observation. I, if I could go back to uh, agritourism, I, I find that word just a little uh, difficult. It's certainly in, in our, um, uh, for us, because we're a pick your own apple op operation. We're only 35 kilometers uh, from Ottawa South, 50 from center of Ottawa. So we don't really consider ourselves tourism, um, more of a of an essential service, really. We've been doing this now for almost 50 years. Um, now, in terms of, of, of the fall, if we're severely limited in terms of the people that we can allow to come out or, you know, or, or whether it's government controlled or not, um, I guess we're, we're sort of looking towards if there is, in fact, assistance for us. Um, but not necessarily under this tourism term. So I guess I, I'm a little concerned about how we sort of fit into this system. Well, um, I, I suppose um, I'm a little, um, um, 
I say, at a loss to define, figure out where, where that would fit too. Now, obviously the, the challenges we face is that um, the tourism part, the part of, the, of your activity that, um, that makes it closer to tourism is not essential service. And that's also because it requires the gathering of people. And so obviously that's a, a place that, um, uh, that the, the COVID um, restrictions is trying to avoid. That's how we're trying to uh, mm -hmm. beat the virus. So we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want in any way inflict upon that. Because as I said, when we opened up, the number one priority is to keep our people not only safe, but alive. And so oh. and everything we can do to do that. Now, how we can work that back into our agriculture um, thing, um, we'd have to have a look at that. But uh, the, actually what you do and what you grow and prepare is food. So um, you fit with us there, but I don't know how that, uh, that would go when we put it into the tourism part, the gathering of people together. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're having- We can have a look at that and see uh, where, if it could, but I, I, uh, I don't want to leave any false hope. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, believe, I believe we're having some mic issues, unfortunately, with Julia uh, on there. Um, I'm not it's sure. Definition of yeah. yeah. On, uh, on there. Uh, but what we'll do, maybe, uh, Adrian, I'll have the last question. I believe there was a question we can wrap up with. And Julia, I'll make sure you can connect with Jim, and I'll connect with you to feed that up to the minister since we're having some mic issues. But, uh, Adrian, I believe we had a question on farmers markets, but maybe we can wrap up with that. Just to ask the minister on the status of those. Absolutely. So yes, we've actually had a couple come in on, on that as well, asking if farmers markets are something that is going to be uh, on the table as we move further into this summer. Well, farmers market are on the table today. Okay, the farmers market are allowed today. Um, what we have to do is make sure that we get Board of Health approval that we can manage the challenges that you face, the, the distancing and so forth. Because the only, the, the only challenge with farmer's market is, again, a whole bunch of people, since it's not confined, necessarily confined, um, or if it is, it's very, uh, uh, the people are very close together. When you pack a room full of people, where when you put your hand in your pocket to pay, you find out that it's in your neighbor's pocket, um, that's too close for uh, any, regardless of what the activity is. If you, if you look at the supermarkets, they have to, they can only allow so many people in at the same time based on square footage. They have to, outside as they're waiting, they have to have at least six foot apart between them and all those type of things. You have to have sanitization for the, uh, for the, the hand washing and all that must be done for the farmer's market too. But if they can do that, um, they, they can open today. Good to know. And maybe what I would encourage if we do have any um, if we do have any farmers markets uh, members that are on the call or even some of our local municipal folks as well, it would be a good idea to reach out to Dr. Paul and our, East, and our Eastern Ontario Health Unit now to begin those conversations on social distancing practices just so when they're ready to open up, they're not running into snakes the week of, they can begin to have those conversations to do them safely and smoothly. But that's, that's great to hear that clarification that they're you're good yeah. to go. I, I think I, you're totally right, Eric, and I, I think it's important to, to remember that the farmers markets, I know in my city, they, in Woodstock, uh, they closed up immediately when the COVID thing, when the COVID situation started, but it wasn't because they were forced to close. It was because they didn't feel comfortable because they couldn't meet the required separation distance and so forth. So they decided in the best interest of the people and themselves, they just didn't open up. But it's, uh, that's never been part. They were always part of the um, um, essential service of the food chain. Good to know. And I'll just mention there too, I had a, a meeting on Saturday with, uh, uh, with a constituent, Amanda Berger, and we were talking about that, about farmers markets or local food and getting them out. And one of her ideas was maybe a bit of a mobile service in some senses too, of uh, the ability to do that. And I know she'd, uh, she'd made some uh, Facebook inquiries to local people as well, but if there was a, an interest in some sort of aspect with farmers markets and getting those local products out, um, if you wanted to connect with my office, I can certainly connect anybody with, uh, with Amanda and her ideas to get the ball rolling and get thinking about something a little bit different than the Prescott Russell model. Uh, that's a much larger scale, but uh, albeit something at least to start by here uh, and to consider for sure. Um, Adrian, do we have, uh, maybe what we'll do is we, I, I see we're about two minutes too, and I know we want to wrap up at nine o'clock. Maybe what we'll do is um, 
We had a question from Jackie Pendleton too. Sure, Jim, did you want to ask that question, perhaps get a response? Maybe we'll wrap up with that question, just trying to finish up uh, around nine o'clock. Do you have that uh, with you? Yeah, I see Jackie's on the line. Sure. Let me see if we can get her. I can read it. I have it here, though. But sure, yeah. If you, if you wanted to read it there, I can't seem <clears> to get you. But I think Jackie pre-submitted anyway. If you want to read the question, perhaps the minister can address that as a wrap-up. Sure. So, in Eastern Canada, three out of uh, every four finished cattle are processed in one plant in Guelph. The, the fragility of the food supply chain has been further exposed with recent closures, disruptions to other beef processing facilities in North America. Um, I'll just go down to the question. Do you support the request for the of BFO and CFA to implement a set-aside program to assist in the current critical situation being faced by Canadian beef farmers and ranchers? The objective of a set-aside program is to delay the marketing of cattle. The program would be designed to encourage farmers to hold cattle on maintenance rations removed from the value chain for at least eight weeks. This would allow cattle marketing to stretch over a longer period of time and be managed by existing packing uh, capacity until slaughter capacity can be regained. The program was originally developed in concert with governments and the Canadian beef industry during the BSC era and considered successful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And, and, um, and I agree with the, during the BSC, uh, and I've been around at Queen's Park a long time. I was there when that happened too. But um, the, the, um, um, at that time, the, the event was uh, the cause of the backlog. Uh, one of the differences today is that we had the, a, a, quite a shortage of beef processing uh, before uh, the COVID the event started. It's got much worse since then, and it's got even more, uh, what should we say, worse uh, in the last week or two when the two plants in Alberta have closed down. So it's become a national uh, challenge now. It's uh, mine, but not working. As last, at, at last um, um, a meeting with the federal minister and all the provincial ministers, uh, there was a very strong presentation from Saskatchewan for just what you mentioned, the, uh, the set-aside program. And uh, so uh, the federal minister uh, said she would look at that. We're also working on some figures with, with ours to see whether it's possible to work. The challenge and that's why I mentioned the earlier one, the challenge with it is if we have a shortage of capacity for um, be without the COVID, when, at what point can we process the backlog? And, and, and so uh, that's, that's a, a real question we need, to, we need to address. And I think collectively, we should have done it before and we sure have to start after immediately after COVID's over, we have to find a way to increase our capacity to process the cattle in this province, or uh, we're going to have this uh, problem continually. If we don't have the capacity to process the ones we're growing, at what point do we do we benefit from the set aside program? Uh, and, and I said that was going to be the last question, but I feel bad because I think Julia might have got her microphone figured out here. Let me just see, Julia, are you there? Can you hear me now? I can hear. I can you hear you. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I'll try and talk um, relatively quickly. Now, since I first reached out to Eric, a few of the questions that I had uh, addressed at that point in time have been already addressed, um, with the main concern being in support for our processing and restaurants. So, um, as a dairy producer, um, I think we feel largely, mostly for the restaurant industry, as it has been hit significantly with this COVID-19 um, and that uh, that does obviously have an impact on our industry as well as processing. So we just wanted to make sure that um, if there was any, what the support was in the in this, the food, just food chain system um, in order to make sure that, I mean, our processing capacity is having to change um, overnight now that we have had six weeks, but from producing cream in 25 kilo bags to 2% milk in a, in a one liter bag. Um, and that, that, that takes some significant adjustment. And then um, the second part of that question then is on the retail side. I know there's a lot of frustration still comes from the consumers when they see limits at the grocery store level. Um, in terms of a, a two bag limit. 
I know part of that is because we want to make sure we get milk everywhere, but I know there's some companies like Walmart who has mandated that uh, across all of their stores. And even now when we do have supply available, um, they're not allowing their store managers to put the orders in so that we can fulfill that demand. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And I, um, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I found it um, very unsettling when we, in the same day that I hear that we're dumping milk, I hear that people are going in the store and, and it happened, my wife was looking for milk and my um, um, daughter-in-law was being told she couldn't buy enough milk for the week for the family because that would take uh, four bags and she could only have two. So I think that's a, a big problem. I met this morning with the, uh, the executive of the milk, uh, the Dairy Farmers of Ontario they told me they have things pretty well ironed out now that there will be no more no more limits. It was really the, the distribution system, not the lack of milk, but the distribution system that if they uh, they couldn't get it all to the right places at the right time, and so there was always somebody out before they got there. But they said they they have it um, they haven't uh, they have it worked out. They have um, decided that they're going to slightly reduce the quota for everyone but they're not going to dump any more milk. And so uh, they think they have, for the present time, they have the, uh, the supply chain arranged such that we can do it on the one stream instead of having the food service stream in it. Um, obviously there's still some going to the food service uh, stream, but not the extent that it was. So uh, hopefully we have that problem solved. And if it, if it doesn't get solved in the next, um, in the next week, uh, uh, I'll have to call them back in because they faithfully promised that that was going to happen. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Julia, for being able to get on your mic there. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. With, with it being five after nine, what we'll do, I think we're going to wrap up. We wanted to keep this to an hour. And what I will say again is I know there was a couple in the queue there uh, that had questions, but we'll uh, we'll follow up with those hands that are raised. Uh, but I want to be cognizant of the Minister's time there. So, uh, Minister, if you have any, any wrap-up comments, we could... Uh, oh, yeah. I just again want to say thank you to all um, uh, to all the participants for being here this evening and providing us with the opportunity to kind of uh, what should we say get our message out as to the answers to the questions that you have and uh, I uh, I also want to say that um, we, we started off by mentioning the uh, the essential workers and not the plants not being able to get the workers and I said the one single thing that we can all do to get the workers to come to work is show that we appreciate it when they come to work. And, and I don't think we've always done that. And I can assure you, we haven't always done that for our producers either. We want to say thank you very much for what you do, because it's you that make the food supply chain work. And that's where it starts. And if it didn't start, it'd never get to the end. So thank you, what you uh, for what you do. And the people of Ontario appreciate, even though sometimes we can only get two bags of milk, we appreciate the milk we do get. So thank you very much for what you do. And thank you for having me here this evening. Well said, Jimmy, any closing comments? Well, I just want to thank uh, Minister Hardiman and Ernie for coming out. Uh, Ernie's always been there when you need to talk or discuss an issue and uh, certainly has a lot of experience and appreciate the coming out tonight. So thanks, Ernie. Thank Robert, you. I'll just wrap up that we're going to send an email out likely tomorrow uh, that's going to have a link to that business seminar video from Friday for uh, businesses that are interested in learning more about the emergency wage subsidy, the business account, and some of those things. And also, I'll work with Jim to send out that link to the uh, Ernie mentioned, uh, Minister Hardiman mentioned about the program about linking workers in the ag sector. We'll make sure we get a link sent out to that. So if there are uh, people that are looking to post in our area, you know where to go and we'll promote where, where potential employees can look as well. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. We'll have another session likely in a week or 10 days on some federal issues as well with the federal special guests. But I consider us very lucky in Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry to have had the minister here. We're very, very lucky. If I could just, just finish off, uh, Eric, uh, you mentioned the link. We also have a website at our ministry to link the, uh, uh, the worker with the employers. And, and hopefully, um, if, you, if you go to that site, it'll show you where people need help and where you can find jobs, summer jobs or some, any other kind of jobs. Wonderful. We'll, we'll make sure we get that link sent out. And uh, with that, we'll thank everybody very much. Thank you again, Minister. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank and you. Everybody. Take care, stay well, and we'll be in touch in future town halls to keep you posted. And then most importantly, to hear your feedback as uh, things that are happening on the ground. Stay well, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.